so far we've only looked at uh, hazards in terms of the probability of a fatality occurring or uh, the, the probability of a number of fatalities occurring. Now failures of infrastructure can not only result in fatalities but also have large economical consequences. Uh, so if you want to analyze the, the cost of uh, improving your safety or decreasing your risk exposure, uh, it is inevitable that you have to place some monetary value on human life. It is a contentious exercise, but it is unavoidable if you want to do a comprehensive risk analysis of your hazard exposure. Now, any country's economy is ultimately made up of the people that are active in it. Um, and this gives us one way to determine the value of one year of a human life in a statistical sense without specifically referring to any individual or, or, or group of indi individuals. Uh, so the, the, the way this is done follows from basic microeconomic models where the work leisure optimization principle um, informs the societal value of um, employment. So the idea is that life consists of a balance of working to earn your living, so generating income, and leisure time, which you spend enjoying the fruits of your labor. And different societies have different proportions of time that they spend uh, between these two activities. That proportion we will denote through W. Also, every society has a life expectancy, and so there's some proportion of your total life uh, which you will you then spend in leisure. And given a level of economic activity in the country, the, uh, the economy has a gross domestic product and, and society can spend some fraction of that gross domestic product specifically to reduce its exposure to hazards. And that will denote as, as G. Now these parameters reflect a given society's choices in terms of how they live their life and, in, and how they apply their economic activity to improve their quality of life. Um, and those choices can be summarized uh, into a single indicator metric which we call the life quality index. Now notice that the life quality index represents an, an, an interaction between an increased economic activity, generating income, and an increased amount of time spent enjoying the, the fruits of that labor, so uh, reflecting the quality of life. So the figure over here contrasts to society, where the second society has a li higher life expectancy, but has a lower uh, economic activity. Um, and so you can see that even though the second society may be deemed to be less wealthy, if that society uh, is spending a smaller proportion of its time generating income, uh, it may still end up with a higher uh, life quality index than the society with the larger income but a shorter life, uh, uh, life expectancy. So now that we're able to quantify the, the, the overall quality of life um, for, a given, uh, for, for a given society, one thing that we can that, that comes out of this is a marginal value for increasing the life expectancy in the context of that society's gross domestic product. So if we implicitly differentiate our, our expression for the LQI, uh, we can end up with this expression. Now keep in mind that this term represents an investment, so it's negative, and this term um, is only meaningful if what you're doing results in an increase in the life expectancy. Um, so what this then gives you is a minimum increase in your average life expectancy that you need to get to make a given investment of your gross domestic product in uh, increasing safety uh, a meaningful exercise. Now because this term represents an increase in the length of human life, what this actually gives you is, is a marginal value of human life in the context of your gross domestic product. So in other words, we now have an equivalent or a statistical value of human life in a macroeconomical context, uh, which uh, dictates our ability to pay for, increased, for, for increasing safety. And for that reason, we sometimes refer to this as, the society, as society's willingness to pay for safety. 
so and so another way to think of this is as a minimum level of safety that a given society can afford. So let's suppose that we have a project where we have to choose how, how much we're going to spend on safety. And given the range of technology available to us, we can progressively spend more money for higher degrees of safety until we reach some value where the marginal cost of safety, which is to say the slope of the line of our cost as a function of safety, corresponds to this society's to this societal willingness to pay value. Um, now, as you'll see in a bit, we may choose to spend more on safety than this particular value that corresponds to our societal willingness to pay for safety. But it does not make sense for us to spend less than that because society as a whole requires us to at least achieve this level of safety. Okay, now as I mentioned uh, earlier, structural design generally seeks to balance safety and economy. That is to say, we want to have an optimal combination of the measures that we take to mitigate the hazard of structural failure and the cost of implementing those measures. Uh, now, to, to develop this methodology, let's consider the cost of a given failure in the context of its probability. And so we're going to ask, what is the expected value of the cost of that failure? So let's say we have the distribution function for our performance function. So notionally, that might look like what I have over here. Um, although, of course, in general, what this would actually be is a uh, expression in terms of individual parameters um, of the loading and of the resistance. So let's denote the amount that would be payable if failure occurs, which is to say the cost of failure through D for damages. And so, the, and so the consequences of failure viewed as a function function of the performance function is a step function, where the cons consequence has value D if failure occurs, and there's no consequence if failure does not occur. Now the expected value of the cost of failure then follows from the expected value function applied to the cost of failure. Um, and because this is zero everywhere where failure does not occur, we can take d out of the integral and evaluate the integral only in the region where uh, the cost of failure is non-zero, which is an integral which corresponds to the probability of failure. In other words, our expected cost of failure or the expected value of the cost of failure is equal to the product of the value that would be payable if failure occurs, so our damages, and the probability of failure. And, and this gives us the formal statistical definition of um, risk. And it allows us to express our exposure to a ha hazard in monetary terms. Now, now let's suppose that we have some variable that we can choose um, that results in different levels of safety. Um, so shown on the x-axis here would be that variable uh, where smaller values of it results in less safe structures and higher values of it um, is associated with great, greater safety. So greater safety implies lower probabilities of failure. So uh, if we plotted the risk as a function of this variable, we will get this asymptotically decreasing curve. Now obtaining a given level of safety requires us to pay a certain amount. So if for argument's sake we, have, we assume that the marginal co cost of safety is constant, uh, the result of that is then a simple increasing straight line. Um, and our expected and, and our total expected loss uh, is going to be the amount of money that we have to pay for safety plus our exposure to failure, so our risk, which gives us a, a curve for the expected loss that looks like this. So you'll see that there's a range of values of our decision variable, sort of over here, where our expected loss is as low as we can make it. And so from the perspective of, of trying to optimize our exposure to risk, choosing a value for our decision value somewhere over here is uh, the best choice. So 
um, if we were to choose a value lower than our exposure then our risk exposure is too high whereas if we chose a value that is higher than this optimal value we would be choose we, we would we would be paying a lot more than we otherwise would have now, now the optimal value of our decision variable uh, will change if either the marginal cost of safety changes or uh, the cost of failure changes. So shown on the left here are two cases where the only difference between the two uh, are different values of the cost of failure. And so increasing the cost of failure means you increase uh, the value of the risk. So you, you, you would go from the blue curve up to this red curve. You can see as a result of that, the value of your decision variable where the expected loss is at a, at a minimum shifts to a higher value. And remembering that that decision variable corresponds to a given level of safety, that, in, that, that means that a higher level of safety is now optimal. So in other words, if the consequences of failure are more severe, a higher level of safety will be more optimal. Um, so, so the other side is if, of, of this is if the cost of safety changes. Now what I'm referring to here specifically here is the marginal cost of safety, which is the slope of this line. So you can see that if your, your cost of safety goes down, which is to say your slope of the line goes from that down to this, um, then the location of your optimal value of your decision variable also increases. Uh, which is to say, if the marginal cost of safety decreases, the optimal level of safety increases. Now up to this point, our risk optimization uh, was done without looking at any constraints from uh, society's willingness to pay. So let's say we, that we again have these two contrasting cases where we have two distinct societies, one with a relatively low society willingness to pay for safety, and one with a relatively high societal willingness to pay for safety. Then for a given optimization problem, the, the, the willingness to pay value of the first society uh, might fall at a value that is smaller than the optimal beta value. So, which is to say that the optimal level of safety um, uh, is higher than the, the, the minimum level of safety that this, that society uh, will will pay for, and so it is um, economically more beneficial to have your level of safety at the location where where, where your risk exposure is optimal than at your uh, willingness to pay value. So in this case, your target level of safety uh, sh should correspond to uh, the risk optimal value. In contrast, if the societal willingness to pay value sits above your uh, risk optimal value, so let's say our second society's uh, willingness to pay sits above the, optim the risk optimal safety level, then that society is willing to pay for higher levels of safety than what is dictated by the optimal value. And so its target level of safety should correspond to the higher value that it is uh, willing to pay for. So following numerous academic studies, a standardized set of more or less um, optimal reliability values have been derived in this way that take into account the cost of safety and the consequences of failure. And you can see how for any given uh, cost class, larger consequences of failure are associated with larger beta values. And for any, any consequence of failure class, smaller relative costs of safety are associated with higher beta values. So, so based on these values and some local conditions, the various national standardization bodies then uh, adapt their own values uh, to use in calibrating their local design standards. So for example, for the Eurocodes, they've chosen a reference lifetime reliability value of 3.8 which you'll see corresponds to the highest reliability dictated by uh, the ISO 2394 uh, suggestions. 
in contrast, the South African lifetime target reliability is 3.0, which is more of a median value um, considering the r range of suggestions from ISO 2394. So these values are then used in calibrating the various individual structural design standards that um, are used in, that are used in a given country. And what we'll do next is to take a quick look at how that calibration exercise um, is done.